So before we start, it's still for the first speaker, it's, it's really hard to start because you not really know what comes, what, what will happen. Uh, and so the, the first one has a really hard job and that's why we have a opfalum. So I don't know what's this in English, so the, we, we sacrifice somehow the first speaker uh, <laughs> just <laughs> in order that you, have, you, you uh, get used to what's coming. So she will speak out of competition, but it's not necessary that she's in competition because she has already won last year. So uh, could you please, yeah, you are already in the way to get ready. So she comes from the Deutsche Elektronen Synchrotron in Hamburg, and she actually, yeah, she tries to build a new one. And, uh, Let's welcome Judita Beinotaite. All right, let's see how this works. Um, I'm not perfectly, let's say, well acquainted with technology, so. Okay, well, I don't have fingerprints. So. Right. Well, let's hope this works first time. My name is Judita, and I am very delighted and grateful to be invited to give my science slam here. Actually, I was here at this SKM conference about six months ago, and again, I was very grateful and privileged to leave it with my own prize Einstein, who, um, who inspires me by sitting in my office every day to this day. Um, he also distracts me, and that's because he has this little solar cell where, which receives light, light and like makes him do that. Um, which is fine until you get very, very generous lighting from Daisy, <laughs> and then he does this. <laughs> so, of course, there's no space for violence like that in my office. So what I did is I folded a piece of paper and I put it on top of the cell, and that helped. And I was really proud of myself because I, I wielded the power of photons with paper. You know, nothing beats photons like paper, and nothing beats paper like scissors. <laughs> ah, yes, the famous photon-paper-scissors game. <laughs> um, so if you're interested in wielding particles, you're in the right place, because I'll be giving a talk on plasma accelerators. So I chose to do science because I love science, and I was often <laughs> bugged by a lot of these existential questions, like, why does the universe exist? What's, what is Big Bang? Um, are there extra dimensions? What is dark matter? Is there an underlying theory of everything? Will we discover something totally new? Or even, can our discoveries be made within the capacity of available civil engineering technology while remaining environmentally, economically, and socially sustainable, and within the limited taxpayers' budget dedicated to the high energy physics sector? <laughs> a lot, a lot of complicated questions. And I might not be able to answer them tonight, but a tool that can help us is particle accelerators. Machines that accelerate particles with electromagnetic fields. And the particles can be um, electrons, protons, anti-electrons, or even the whole ion. And if these questions don't bother you, that's fine. Uh, but that doesn't mean that accelerators, sh accelerators shouldn't be important to you. And that's because they only make up a very small fraction in high energy physics, as in where they're used around the world, they're used mostly in in radiotherapy, so cancer treatment, and where they use in high energy physics only makes up a very small fraction. So they are really the tool of our era. So let's go back to that existential question, a new quest for accelerators. We can shorten it to this. Can we make our accelerators smaller, cheaper, more sustainable? Well, to answer this, we need to think what are accelerators made of? 
currently, they consist of um, beam diagnostics, magnets, magnets, and people inside of magnets. <laughs> but main acceleration happens in accelerating cavities, which sustain electric fields as particles pass through them. The higher the field, the higher energy the particles will gain as they go through the cavity, and the more cavities you have in the row, the more energy the particles will gain as they go through all these cavities. So what if we need higher energies? Well, you can increase the electric field, but if you go too far, this happens, electrical breakdown. You could also have many cavities in a row. But what if you need even higher energies, like ones you need for future particle physics projects? Then you need very large facilities, 15 kilometers of scale. But what if you need even higher energies for even further particle physics experiments? Well, then you need, you know, the very famously achievable extraterrestrial projects um, on the moon. Um, but let's go back to Earth. Even moderate energy accelerators are quite large. So to answer this question, we need to really think about the cavities. We need high acceleration fields. And I work with people that think that we should just keep going, keep cranking it up and settle down for somewhere around here. Plasma, the fourth state of matter where atoms and molecules are separated into ions and electrons. You can find it on the, you can find it on the, sorry, because I'm, I'm an accelerator scientist, so I don't see a lot of it, so I forget it. Um, you can find it on the sun, right. Um, and with this plasma, then you can have accelerators such as these. So 15 centimeters of plasma would accelerate particles to the same energies as a 15 meter conventional cavity could. So in theory, you could have one kilometer of plasma and that would accelerate particles to one tera electron volt. Uh, the sort of energy that would take tens of kilometers of conventional cavity to accelerate. So sounds quite promising, right? But on the other hand, if now we're taking these super clean and well-developed conventional accelerators and gonna replace them with this complicated and temperamental plasma, that might sound quite hopeless to you. And if it does, then you're wrong because there's more hopeless things out there. For example, when I tried to be a football player. So on the left, you can see a video of me playing my first football match. So I sneak up on the ball. I don't know what to do with it. I pass it to the opposing team. <laughs> Oops. Um, yeah, but just because I play football bad doesn't mean the football can't be played well. Equally, we can accelerate particles in plasma. The way we do it is that we have a driver that can be a laser pulse, a proton bunch, but in this case we use electron bunches, and it enters the plasma. As it enters the plasma, it creates a wake field, this accelerating environment in which a trailing bunch or a witness um, gains energy, and that can be electron bunches for that matter as well. Um, a good analogy of that is this well-played football game where you'll see player one receive a ball, dribble around opponent team's players, drawing them around him, and then he passes the ball to his teammate who's open and free to score a goal, and the teammate scores a goal. So player one receives a ball, and like a driver, he creates a wake field. He creates a goal-scoring opportunity. He passes the ball to his friend or team player, and goal is scored. Witness is accelerated. So just because you play football once well doesn't mean you're a good football player. Equally, you need to accelerate electrons well many times in plasma to prove a point. And a good example of that is the Higgs discovery in 2012. So in 2012, uh, when Higgs discovery was announced, Large Hadron, uh, Large Hadron Collider was operated at 100 million collisions per second, and it took them one year to announce the discovery of Higgs. Now, if we're gonna use plasma accelerators for that, which currently operate at around one hertz, so one collision per second, it would take us 100 million years to announce the discovery of Higgs, which means that we should have started way, way earlier. <laughs> um, the difference, though, between Large Hadron Collider and plasma accelerator plants is that instead of protons, we will be accelerating 
electrons and anti-electrons. And that's a more data efficient process because protons are composite particles, so when they collide, it's like a crowd of people meeting and talking, so there's a lot of noise. But when electrons and anti-electrons collide, the fundamental particles, it's like two people meeting together. So we can make out the conversation much better. So that means we would need less collisions per second to discover Higgs in one year. So more, more Higgs for less data. Um, but that still means that's 10,000 years for plasma accelerators. Um, so clearly, you need high repetition rate. You need high repetition rate for future facilities, including plasma accelerators. So what's the issue in plasma? Plasma is complicated to repeat things in many times. And that's because it's a complex and complicated dynamic system of ions and electrons moving around, interchanging energy. And then you have a bunch going through and, and creating its own myriad of processes afterwards. And you need to know what happens to, to do the, the next acceleration event. Um, well, to the rescue come the mosh pit experts, and that is my research experiment. Uh, flash forward, a real plasma accelerator. So, introducing Flash Forward. It is an American television series based on a 1999 science fiction. Oops, I think that's the wrong thing. This is Flash Forward. Um, it is in Daisy in Hamburg and we are attached to the flash free electron laser um, LINAC, from which we receive electrons, and those electrons reach our plasma chamber, which is hooked up with high voltage wires and, and ga gas pipes, and in, in there, with those things, we create plasma. And in that plasma, uh, the electrons get accelerated. So to know when we can repeat the next acceleration event, we put the same bunch after the first one, not the same bunch pair, the driver and the witness. And we see that it takes 63 nanoseconds for the plasma to recover to its initial state so we can repeat the next acceleration process. And that is really hopeful because if we had many bunches like that separated at 63 nanoseconds, that, was, that would give us a collision rate of 10 millions per second. So with an electron-anti-electron collider, kind of simply calculated, that would give us a Higgs discovery in way better than one year. I think that would be about eight hours. And that's great news, because for once, PhD students could go home before 5 p.m. <laughs> um, so what's the moral of the story? Basically, what I'm trying to say, that while there's a lot of promising results, this is just the beginning for plasma accelerators, and there's still a lot to do and a lot of limits and obstacles to overcome before we can answer those questions. But that's kind of hopeful, you know? Because we, as scientists, as humans, we, we find these limitations, but they don't limit us. As long as we sit down and work on them, on high energy physics, on repetition rates, on plasmas. And that itself opens its own depth and wealth of new questions and lands of exploration that allows us to never cease to discover new things about our universe, revealing dizzying heights of of, of what research is. Um, what I meant to say is that some wacky ideas, such as using plasma to accelerate, can sometimes be quite serious. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greta Palotaito.